Oh my gosh. Um, this has been a really, really, really long week for a lot of Alaskans. And um, we had planned a more political show tonight. We are going to be discussing um, ballot initiative two. Uh, but we thought it would be in light of the events of Senator Stevens passing that we would talk to some of his friends and people that knew him very, very well and uh, get their thoughts and, uh, and get them on record right now. So we'll be back with the show. Yeah. Welcome uh, back to More Up North. I'm Shanna Moore, and I am glad. Last week, we spent some time with Joelle Hall uh, talking to her about Ballot Prop 1, or Ballot Initiative 1. And uh, we had invited the other side. They were unable to make it, which is curious. And, and it's a strange thing. Um, for Prop 2, the same thing has happened. We have invited both sides, and we actually had a commitment from the Ballot Initiative 2 people to come. However, they are not here. So um, Dr. Monique Karaganis is here. And um, tell people exactly what kind of a doctor you are. I mean, you're a pediatrician. You own polar pediatrics. And so I know that this issue, which is uh, the parental notification for a minor to have an abortion, people might say we should have had a, a, uh, a gynecologist on. But you actually deal with a lot of kids. Sure, that's what pediatricians do. We see kids from, from birth to when they go off to college. Um, so you, would, you might be actually seeing people that could have been abused or what other? I've seen teenagers who have chosen to parent and I've seen teenagers who have not chosen to parent. Um, so, so I see teenagers is the bottom line. Um, there's a field of adolescent pediatrics that deals primarily with um, teenagers, but we don't have any in Alaska. And so pretty much teenagers get taken care of by pediatricians in the community. When they have an adult issue like a pregnancy, they would go to an OB-GYN or they would go to an adult doctor if they had like a gallbladder disease or something like that where um, perhaps more specialized care is needed. But for their general health, uh, teenagers really ought to be being seen by their pediatricians once a year. So you're working on the vote no uh, Alaskans against government mandates and um, well, I should clarify I'm not really involved with the campaign at all I'm simply a pediatrician with an opinion on ballot measure two and that's and that's fine too I, I, I mean obviously you're they're more represented though than the other side right now um, I, and I, was, I should mention the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics Alaska chapter has put out a statement in regards to proposition two as has the national body of the American Academy of Pediatrics not on proposition two particularly but on this issue and what was their statement um, our statement is that teenagers need to be able to contact their physicians and have confidential conf conversations with their pediatricians about a lot of different topics, including reproductive rights. And so the American Academy of Pediatrics, the ACOG, which is the American, Acad or American College of ob -GYNs, have universally said, and the AMA, have universally said that teenagers deserve confidentiality when it comes to these issues because not addressing these issues for teenagers puts them more at risk. And so giving them an outlet that is safe and confidential is important, just like you would want as an adult, I'm sure. Well, I know that I've, I've talked to several people about this, and I, I really honestly am cynical enough to think that this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a ballot bait issue. You know, you put something on the ballot that creates all this drama. If it's constitutional or not, it doesn't matter. Just get it on there because it'll get people to show up and it'll push all those buttons. And this button, which is, you know, basically, if you don't vote for this, you're, you're saying, um, you know, oh, well, you, you're fine with girls just going in and getting abortions or something like this. We're not, I, I'm a mother of a teenage girl. I'm, I deal with lots of other parents of teenage girls. This isn't about my daughter. This isn't about the, the girls that she spends time with. I mean, I think our parental notification is, where are you? You'll be home at this time, you know, this sort of thing. Can you talk a little bit about who this law is really going to hurt? Well, first of all, I'm gonna say I don't think you're a cynic. I think you're an optimist. But maybe that's my optimism coming out. Um, you know, 
teenagers, the majority of them involve their parents. And if you want your child to turn to you about issues with drugs or alcohol or what they want to be when they grow up or whether or not they're ready to parent, those are all communication issues that need to have been addressed when they were two and five and seven and throughout their whole childhood. And you build that relationship of trust and you build that relationship of communication over time. Really it can't be mandated. You can't force a family to communicate that hasn't already established that. And when we talk about this not being your daughter, when you ask about like where are you, who are you with, what are you doing, those are things that parents who are involved in their teenagers' lives have been doing for years long before reproduction is even an issue. Or before a law was going to tell them how to communicate. Sure. And so what we have found is that in most studies, teenagers do involve their parents. And that's actually when you when you look at, um, you know, our the counterpart has not shown up, but one of their talking points is that teenagers don't involve parents, and actually they don't have studies that support that. More than 80%, close to 87% of kids involve their parents in the decision to have an abortion. And so it's a very small portion that don't. And really what you have to ask yourself, okay, well that 13% that doesn't involve their parents, what is that about? And when we look at Alaska, we're the number one, number one state for alcoholism, we're the number one state for sexual abuse of children. And so and incest. you can imagine, sure, and you can imagine that that 13% come from a home that may not be stable. And, and teenage pregnancy can cause a family crisis. It can increase the likelihood for abuse to happen. And you know, some, um, I, I had written a piece for the ADN that's also been published in a couple of other papers around the country, including the press, or I'm sorry, around the state, including the press. And some feedback that I got around that was, well, these kids are abused, you should try to get them out of the home, you should protect them from abuse, report to the state. And you know, I think that's one of the most insulting um, accusations is that we as physicians are protecting predators. That's not the case. We as physicians are mandated reporters. And so the physicians at Planned Parenthood or anywhere else in the country or in the state, whether they're pediatricians or ob gynes if we are aware of abuse, we do report it. It's not just the doctors that are mandated by law. It's, it's teachers. It's, it's teachers. Police but it's, officers. It's, but the firemen. list is so huge. It is people that sell hearing aids. If they suspect abuse, by law, they have to report. Park rangers. I mean, it's it. it yeah. If you so abuse gets reported, but I think we have to look and see if you're a teenager. Let's say you're 17 in an abusive home with an alcoholic parent who's going to beat you, and maybe he's even the father of the child. Is is reporting that abuse going to create change? Our foster system is overtaxed. The solution for teenagers in foster systems is not great. For some teenagers, really, if abuse doesn't reach the level of needing to be pulled out of the home, needing to have state involvement, the safest choice for them may be to wait the six months until they're old enough to make their own choices. And, and really, I, what I worry about is what if you're a teenager in the bush in Alaska? You're related to everyone in the community. How are you going to get someone to notarize that you've been abused? And if everyone's related to one another, how are you going to be able to do that in any kind of confidential fashion? Or what if you have a magistrate that flies in for three days a month at the school gym? Or, you know, you don't just have a courthouse that you can go see a judge at any point. Mm -hmm. This isn't about you know, who people are thinking it's about. It's not about their daughter. It's about somebody in this state right now, percentage-wise, is, is going to get pregnant by a parent or a step-parent. And why would you force them into a position where they would be Googling how to take care of that issue themselves? And that's certainly something we need to address as a state, alcoholism, incest. Those are things that we can collectively as a community address. And I think it's important to address. But this particular law does not help no matter where you stand on the abortion debate. If you pass this law, in other states it's been done. You don't decrease the number of teenage abortions. You actually just increase the number of second trimester abortions, increasing the risk to the teenager. Because teenagers wait to tell their parents instead of telling them right away. Another false part of the debate is the idea that, you know, if, if your child's going to get an aspirin at the school, you need to sign a consent. Well, you know, aspirin is available over the counter. Teenagers can get it. Teenagers are not going to die from a headache. This isn't a life-changing event, having a headache. Deciding whether or not you want to be a parent is a life-changing event. And really, is it supposed to be a grandparent's choice, or is it a parent's choice? Because the commitment's going to be on the side of the parent. And, and at the same time, I mean, if, if, you're not in, if you're not having a close enough communication to know that your child's pregnant, 
then maybe you're not going to be the person that they're going to go to and really be seeking that advice out from. Absolutely. You establish communication with your teenager the 10, 15 years you've known them before that. So when, where can people go to, to sort of see this side by side? Unfortunately, uh, the people that thought it was, this was uh, such a powerful thing to put on the ballot didn't want to come and discuss it tonight, uh, perhaps because of my voice cynicism of their stance, but where can people go to find out more? Um, you know, I think you can find out more from um, Alaskans Against Government Mandates. They've got a website with information. Um, Certainly you can find more by looking at the American Academy of Pediatrics statements about confidentiality. Um, I would be happy to take phone calls and go out to coffee with people and talk to them about this issue. I think it really comes down to the fact that no matter where you are in the de abortion debate, this particular law does not work. And other states have tried it and it just doesn't work. Well, thanks for coming in. And um, we'll be back in just a couple moments with our panel. Welcome back to More Up North. I'm, um, I'm thrilled that our panelists were able to all make it today because I think they all have uh, really personal perspec perspectives not only on um, the passing of Senator Stevens but also just historically what that means for Alaska. It's very difficult. If, if Alaska's relationship uh, with Ted Stevens were a Facebook status, it would be it's complicated because <laughs> it is. It simply is. It is. And, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, Jack Roderick was able to come in, a businessman, Anchorage Borough Mayor from 72 to 75, the author of Crew Dreams, A Personal History of Oil and Politics in Alaska, and uh, Jack Practiced Law with Ted Stevens. Thanks for being here. And um, the, the ever sparkly, you were so sparkly. <laughs> oh dear. Harla Ar uh she was elected to the Anchorage Charter Commission, the Anchorage Assembly in the Alaska State Senate from 1978 through 1992. She was the Republican candidate for governor of Alaska in 1986 and 1990, a trustee for the University of Alaska Foundation. She serves as the advisory council for the University of Alaska School of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences in addition to numerous other statewide boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. And she sparkles. Okay, whatever. <laughs> and she says whatever a lot. Uh, and of course, uh, Michael Carey is here. He's a freelance writer, former editor of the Anchorage Daily News, and the host of Anchorage Edition and running on KKM Channel 7. You're TiVo worthy, my friend. You are. And, and someone that I tried to sit as near to during the, uh, the, the trials of the corrupt bastards club as, <laughs> as they were. We so, just never got hats. We did, yeah, we just didn't get out, exactly. So uh, this is a, a difficult week for uh, Alaska. I think um, because this wasn't, a, a, you know, certainly we lost uh, Wally Hickel, and, and people knew that was coming, there was a preparedness for that. Uh, this was a real shock for, for people. Even, and it's hard to explain, a man that was 86 years old, this was a shock for us. But how do you, how do you how do you think this is different because of the way that that senator speaks? well the first thing i would say is that uh, this is a tragedy for senator stevens but it's also a tragedy for a number of other families and particularly those associated with the telecommunications company gci and we know uh, not only did senator stevens die in this accident but a 16 year old girl died in this accident the daughter of one of the co-passengers, a co-passenger herself, and another young man was seriously injured. So this is a, a tragedy for many, many people that will be felt all over Alaska and in other places. Senator Stevens was uh, clearly one of the most unusual men in American history, and I would just say one thing, and then let my colleagues take it up. Uh, my cousin uh, used to say, uh, who, my family was associated with the University of Minnesota and because it's so big they would say anything you say about the University of Minnesota is true and in some seg sense that was true about Ted Stevens similarly if you go onto blogs and commentaries and letters to the editor and editorials and opinion pieces you can find a man who is everywhere and all over the map. Uh, people have many, many things to say about him and saw him very differently. You know, I, I really think that's true. 